It's a very good afternoon to all of you, our cherished viewers of Hot Issues, and welcome to another exciting and interesting edition of Hot Issues. So, lots of issues have been going on, but in the midst of all the issues, in the midst of all the debates, there's still some debate on what really led to the defeat of the NDC. You've heard from the likes of Kofi Adams, you've heard from Yabo Atinjan, but in recent times, there's been another leading member of the party who's been talking about what led to the defeat of the party and what the party must do if the party wants to win elections in 2020. This afternoon, our focus once again is on the NDC. When we return after this break, I'll be introducing my guest and then we find out from him what he believes caused the defeat of the NDC and how the NDC can remedy the situation. This is Hot Issues and I am Winston Amwa. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. Alright, so welcome back from that short break and thanks for staying with us. Now, my guest for this afternoon is one man who knows the NDC. Now, he was Member of Parliament for Laura Nandom. Then became Deputy Health Minister, Minister of Health, became Attorney General, and then he became Member of Parliament for Nandom and eventually Defence Stroke Interior Minister. My guest this afternoon, Dr. Benjamin Kumbo. Good afternoon, Doc, and thank you very much. You're welcome. And I believe you're doing very well. Yeah. How are you coping, are are you coping after the NDC's defeat? Well, quite taking some good rest. Oh, you're having, taking some good rest? Uh, having time to write and having time to do a number of things that time did not permit me when I was in government to do and I guess I'm enjoying it. What things didn't time permit you to do and that's you enjoying your being in opposition? Yeah, basically one of the things that I have spent my time doing is researching mm. into a number of legal issues and as I develop the particular themes I try to key them in, put them in a publisher full form and I've had up to about six, seven of those that were left hanging at some particular point and I only worked on it over the weekends. And I guess that within this brief period of about three to four months, I've been able to do almost the entire first reading and we'll be sending them off to other colleagues to do their own review. Okay, so position hasn't been particularly bad for you. It's come with its own blessings. Well, it is a reality. Hmm. So as to whether it's bad or it's good, once you enter public life, and that has always been my philosophy, you will enter and you have to leave. That is why I remember in the University of Warwick, we were doing psychology of law, and they had a particular film that they used to introduce to the students, in which there was a very unique character. And that character was set in India. So he packed his luggage, went, checked into a hotel, went and took his bath, came back and packed his things back into the, into the suitcase. And when people asked him why he did it, he says, I have arrived. The only thing is that I have to depart. Mm. So on arrival, you should be working towards departure. And no matter how confident you might be, you will know that given the reality of Ghanaian politics, there would be a day in which you'll be in opposition. And you have to always factor that in while you are in government. Did the NDC factor this in while they were in government? Well, as an individual I did, I don't know what some of my colleagues did but i i believe most of the old experience one did it. and did they factor in that this was going to be the time did they know this i mean the last election was going to be that time no i'm not sure many people did you see we engage the political dynamics differently others are actors they get down onto the ground and they are involved in the daily activities a very tiny group which i'll say includes me try to sit down and do a serious analysis of the actors mm. and to see the direction in which all those actions are going. So yes, some certainly saw it coming. You saw it coming? I did. And I'm sure I have mentioned it once or twice to a number of colleagues. Just because I have been around in 1999-2000, I saw the signals very clearly. Mm. I started seeing similar parallels that were developing towards 2016. And as we got closer, you could see clearly that we we're really heading for very rough times. What I did not anticipate was that the margin was going to be that big. My estimation was that we would have gone for a runoff, and the likelihood that we would have lost it in the runoff was there. What were the signals you saw? For instance, 
you have to begin looking at your support base. Mm. How are they reacting to you in government? What are the daily concerns and agitations that they have? How have your opponents been able to send back you into a particular situation, market it to the electorate, even to the extent of marketing it to your party faithfuls? Mm. When you start having those situations, oh, those who are ministers or government appointees are having a good time, we are suffering, there's so much opulence being displayed, all these issues keep coming up. The second one is that I w had done quite a lot of analysis to find which emerging economy that is at the level of Ghana went into an IFMA package with all the austerity measures associated with it and emerged victorious in an election. There might indeed be some country, but I couldn't find one in my search because the conditionalities permeate down to the low level in terms of the hardships. If there's a global problem of youth employment, Ghana has a particular problem of graduate unemployment. To the extent that for the first time in the political history of Ghana, we had an association of unemployed graduates. Mm. That should begin to tell you something. So the IMF deal cost your party's defeat. It played a role. Well, the IMF gave us the conditions and we negotiated We said it was a, what, what, they were homegrown policies. That's what we were told. Yes, and that's what I'm telling mm -hmm. you, that when you have a go homegrown policy, and you say it approximates the IMF conditions in the negotiations, you put it onto the ground, you would find, after all, mm -hmm. that you didn't really reach the real home. Because if you were really the real home, why would the people not embrace it? Hmm. And why I say it's not the real home is that the IMF tells you, you cannot employ. But we say these policies stemmed out of the Senchi consensus. We say these are homegrown policies developed by Ghanaians, presented to the IMF. Yes. So, that's more like you saying the government itself working towards its defeat. That is not exactly what one is saying. But when you characterize the economic outlook at that time in Sinchi mm -hmm. and the conclusions that were reached. You don't carry that home prepared cake and send it to IMF and they just take it and say thank you, say go and implement it. I do not think part of Sinchi would have anticipated the level of graduate unemployment or unemployment generally in the country and the possible consequences of producing that type of industrial reserve army, mm -hmm. which was astronomical. I do not think that the IMF interest in the negotiations with Ghana would be interested in how you handle things. They tell you, look, we want you to look at this deficit. Your fiscal deficit is disturbing. Mm. Immediately you start looking for the physical space. Okay. Your political space is shifting because policies that give you a fiscal space are particularly do not sit comfortably with the political space. Mm. And that's why I said we had to make a choice. If we believe that the only way to go was to keep seeking for a fiscal space, then we should also know we are seeding the political space. The irony about it is that once you lose the political space, you don't even have a fiscal space left. Mm. That's why you must do a type of balance between looking for the fiscal space and trying to also maintain the political space. And these are scientific things and there are tools that you can use to arrive at that balance. And those tools are embedded in the ideology of every social party. Are you suggesting party. that a finance minister didn't get these things right? Well, if you are in an IMF package, mm -hmm. you should know clearly that they have their rules that are governed by a constitution and some regulations. Whether the finance minister was aware of this or he wasn't, the IMF would not play outside their rules. In fact, they didn't come to tie you to come to them to come and give some stability to your economy. You willingly went to them. And so you must be the one that should bear the blame. So take what should government have done in that situation? Yes, it, that's why I say it's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. We all saw the macroeconomic objectives. We saw the challenges that were with them. But there is something in this country, mm -hmm. and I guess it's also a global phenomenon. We have stopped thinking about alternatives. And I do not believe that there is only one solution that can deal with a situation. You need the creativity to be able to see that there must be some alternative 
that can give us this balance between the fiscal space without we necessarily losing the political what space. would have been that alternative and that's why i said that you need a lot of creativity to be able to handle it for instance I will not be a finance minister, but I can tell you mm -hmm. about the level of exposures that we had. Mm -hmm. You had to make it very clear, if you have a clarity of your ideology as a social democrat, your first step to the IMF is that, look, we are a social democratic party. Society is our constituency, mm -hmm. particularly the downtrodden. We are prepared to engage you to give stability to the economy, but for good sake, this area is a red flag zone. We cannot cross it. One of it is employment. One of it is your social infrastructure. One is food security. One is health. And one is education. Mm. The social sector must be handled by the IMF differently for a social democratic party as they will do for a conservative. Did you make the suggestions party. to those who are negotiating with the IMF? Well, we've had these discussions. These are cabinet issues that we cannot discuss here. So it was discussed, but internally, internally you knew these. We issues. have had debates, and yet in cabinet, you went forward for yes, because in, in there is stage. collective responsibility. So it is not what each individual in cabinet feels that is important. It is the agreement that you reach in cabinet. And immediately that agreement is reached. Everybody has to play his role to ensure that it's implemented. Otherwise, you will have as many policies as cabinet ministers. Mm. And that's the significant reality. And a number of important issues. And when people say the cabinet was like a, a rubber stamp cabinet, I wish people could have entered there, particularly on matters of so the economy, in this case, it to was, see how in this case, it is. It was a decision of cabinet, yes. which you, at the time, of course, would have argued differently. But then it was a collective decision, so we all, you all went by it. Well, if I allow you to get away with that, I'm <laughs> giving you some <laughs> confidential cabinet matter. No, but you just told but us. I did mm -hmm. take part in the debate. Yes, but you just but told I'm us. But I'm not saying necessarily... What I asked I'm you, not saying you necessarily... You said you... No, yes, no. I'm, not saying, you let me come. Yes. I'm not saying necessarily that I agreed or I disagreed agreed with it but i'm saying these but issues that disagreed these issues definitely all of us mm -hmm. would not have agreed okay. but the majority agreed and it became policy so ghana's imf program under the ndc was one of the major reasons why the party yes the, the consequences of it you see i don't want it to look like immediately you walk into imf you are already in trouble that is not the, the picture I want to paint. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that when you get into IMF, some conditions will be given to you, which involve review periods and renegotiation of some items. It is how you are able to take advantage of that, how your bargaining skills are. But remember, the strength of your bargaining depends on how your economy is. And so is. you're suggesting that the government didn't see the need to renegotiate or effectively negotiate these aspects that are going to have an impact on the economy. I was certainly not on the negotiating team, but I can say for sure that mm -hmm. perhaps they tried. They did their best. But the, the rigors of the IMF as an institution perhaps did not permit it. And that is why I keep talking about alternatives. That when you have some distortions in your economy or your economy begins to scream, one of the things you should do it's not to look for a one jacket path to address it. You should be thinking about three, four alternatives. Mm. And if we go to the IMF and we see it's not working, you try plan B. And which would have been the plan B? And I'm saying we didn't develop that plan B. That is what I'm saying. I'm not saying one existed. So but I'm like saying that dollar from the, the onset, mm -hmm. that's why I say agenda setting is very important. When you join a debate midstream, you lose it. But from the period of setting the agenda to engage with the IMF, part of the package should have been alt uh, alternatives, just in case what you are sending was not translatable into giving you a favorable political climate. And, and I've seen mm -hmm. some governments that have done that before. Okay, so that's the, the IMF bit. What other thing caused the defeat? Yeah, if you look at it, and this IMF issue that you take also introduces a number of external externalities such for as? instance it to me and in my mind the our openness were very very clear in their mind that no matter what it takes they want to take political power the stakes were very high for them uh. i'm not sure the stakes were the same for us in the ndc either we were too complacent 
or perhaps we just assumed that some infrastructural development will become low-hanging political fruits that we could pluck. All that ended up failing, again because of the peculiar nature of those interventions. There have been massive investment in infrastructure. But if you have looked at the political history of Ghana, and also in some emerging economies, you find that physical structures uh. bring political payoffs if they are pro handled in a particular way. If they are which way? Yes, for instance, if you have a fiscal place like uh, the rich hospital, mm -hmm. the fiscal building is not what brings you political capital. Your messaging must be such that this beautiful infrastructure you have seen has been able to achieve this in terms of health, well-being. And this is what is capable of achieving in the next five and ten years. So there is a hard side of infrastructure, but there must be a soft side. So your brick and mortar, you have to translate it into what improves the human condition. Mm -hmm. And that is how the message should be called. Are you secondly, suggesting that? Okay, go ahead. Secondly, if you were to create a new Dubai, beautiful edifice in Accra, mm -hmm. and you want to market this to get political advantage, and you carry it to say Bunkurugu, and go and show it to people in Bunkuru as one of your achievements, they only turn back to see how dilapidated their village school is. You know what they will tell you after tell you've me. left? Oh, this is what you are doing elsewhere. And you don't even notice that our school is dilapidated. So you have put investment into this sector, an important one that ought to automatically generate some political benefits, but it failed to do so. So you're questioning how these projects were communicated, how the benefits were communicated. When we come back, we'll look at uh, the communication strategy of the NDC in the build-up to the 2016 general election. My guest is Dr. Benjamin Kumo. We go for a short break. When we return, we'll be finding out his challenges with how the NDC communicated its developmental projects. Welcome back from that short break and thanks for staying with us. This is Hot Issues with me, Winston Amoa, and my guest this afternoon, Dr. Benjamin Kumbo. So, Dr. Kumbo, let's get back yes, to the communication bit. Yeah. You're suggesting the party did not communicate its developmental projects well enough to have earned the votes of the public? Well, you are the communication people uh -huh. and you certainly know what the vector of communication is. You could say so many things. But for it to be communication, you must get the response from the other end. The only thing the president as a great communicator. He was communicating. Yes, what I'm saying is that it depends on how you communicate. Nobody is saying that they did not communicate. But what are you communicating? And that's the example that I was giving yes. you. You are saying that we have done infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We have done this. We've done that. And that ought to give us some political goodwill. Mm -hmm. But it did not give the political goodwill. Remember that we are talking post yes. the election. In the run of to the elections, you wouldn't have known this. And you wouldn't even know that your communication is not going down well. It is when you have not had any political benefits from it that you find out that, well, I said this, I did this, I did that. Well, but the basic rule in communication, yeah. which I believe the president would know, is that you're appealing to the emotions. When it comes to political communication, yes. you're appealing to the emotions yeah. of the people because we argue that feelings that are formed by emotion cannot be dislodged by mere reasoning. That's something the president should know as a communicator. Yeah, but that is not the issue. When you are talking about the emotions of the persons, you must be clear in your mind to read those emotions. Because those that's emotions... That's research wait, to know. No, those emotions are not based only on one item. Mm -hmm. It's a totality of things that are interconnected that creates the situation of the emotion. Mm -hmm. And you might find that infrastructure might just be one of them. You, you remove the infrastructure bit and you find mm, unemployment has become part of it. The next one, school fees. The others, national health insurance. So there's a motley of things which you can talk about, but you must also deal with them in how they are interconnected. Mm. Reality cannot be separated into pieces. And that is why you do not target people without taking a holistic approach and distilling the right type of message that links up all these things. Mm -hmm. 
if you say the IMF package is homegrown as broad as this, out of our boring, we'll be able to put this infrastructure in. All these things you have said, and the people still say we have no money in our pocket. What are they communicating? And quite often, don't assume that it is physical money you should come and start but into their pockets. I mean, you've yes. contested elections. Yes. Well, I mean, whichever village you go to, yeah. you know what to tell them, don't you? Yes. Before you tell them whatever you've planned telling them, you'd have sent a team to research yes. what the needs of the people are, don't you? Yes, we do. So, didn't you do that? Didn't the NDC do that? And that's that? why I'm explaining to you that in relation to what we were marketing, mm -hmm. there were other factors which be, were destabilizing. So, yes, you can tell them, I'm coming to tell you about this school, we've done this G block, we've done this, we've done that. And if you watch, in most of the areas in which massive infrastructure development took place, we lost massively there. Exactly. Yes. And that is why I'm explaining to you that did you even need to use the fiscal infrastructure as a way of drawing the attention to the electorate to give you the mandate? Perhaps that's why you need something else. That is an image, a soft image of that fiscal structure. That for me is important. So the president can go and commission a school. This minister can go and commission this. But after the president has finished handing over the hard core infrastructure, the soft core has to be done by the communicators. Mm -hmm. That when the president went to this place and cut the sword for this, it's not just going to be a magnificent building, like I've heard others say about how beautiful a particular building, but that the quality and beauty of that has been translated or is capable of translating itself into improving the human condition. That is the type of mix that I'm talking about. Yes. But some of it, why I say we also need to be fair to ourselves is that this analysis couldn't have taken place if we had not lost the elections. But Dr. Because we would have believed that they mm -hmm. worked. This analysis you're making, yeah. now when you've constructed, I mean, when you've built an infrastructure, yeah. all you're seeking is, okay, so this infrastructure must help me win political power. How do I use this to win political power? Yeah. You've just explained that, and that's something you should have known then. Yeah, it's an art. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that you can't tell me that there's only one variety of communications. You said the former president's excellency is a very good communicator. Mm -hmm. Definitely in all the styles of communication, he would have a flair for one. That's why I would say that. And that flair for one must be based on time and space. Mm. What you go and do on a hospital in Sugakopi, you can't send the same message for a similar hospital, say in Laura. Mm. Because there are a number of mediating mechanisms and political occurrences that will make that be, uh, uh, meaningful. Secondly, you will find that when the fiscal infrastructure is located in an area, it generates automatically some connections and these connections could be that you have sent a nursing school to an area the next thing you notice is that because of the poor results and poor education there only three students from the environment in which the nursing school is built manage to get in there mm. can you ever use that type of infrastructure to win votes in that constituency tell me when 95 percent of the students come from outside that constituency tell me. you can't I am sure about that. Mm. And that's why I'm saying that there's only a context specific way in which these things are done. But that is for infrastructure. Sure. It is not just one of the only things that influences and shape the electorate's way of responding. What else there? I can tell you quite clearly that this stigma of perceived corruption of the NDC government mm. was particularly very, very powerful. And it particularly was powerful because of the times in which we find ourselves. Times in which the economy under the austerity measures was tightening everybody. And it was not tightening only non-NDC people. It also was tightening the belt of NDC people, including floating voters. When you find yourself in this situation, any allegation of corruption is internalized. Particularly when your opponents link it to corruption. That, look, the reason why your circumstances are like that is because they are stealing the money. Sometimes they won't even say corruption. 
Say they are stealing the money. Now, talking about corruption, somebody low down the ladder will just ignore it. Mm. But if you say, Womu you see it clearly mm. that it goes down. And the next day, say, Ampa, me humbaku, now what a air condition, love cruiser. Mm. You see, there is a connection between these things. So once you are able to use what is a template called corruption and you link it to the suffering of people and some disabilities that they have, you are in trouble. But so were, what do were, you do? Were these statements not true? Were some of these suspicions not true? And that's what I'm saying is perception. I have always thrown the challenge mm -hmm. that the, the, there are perpetrators of corruption mm -hmm. and they have identity and they have names. Mm -hmm. I always want people to say, Dr. Kumbu, you are corrupt. You did this and you did that. Then you put us in a, the same level. You have accused me openly and mentioned my name. If I have not done what you have said I've done, then I have my remedy. Mm. You see, but when you say they, 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 you keep, keep, you, 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 you use one brush to apply to every situation. And it is difficult to respond to that complex way of tagging corruption. People are questioning, for instance, how you'd go for a bus branding worth 3.6 million, only for us to say, okay, so that was overpriced, return this amount of money. People are questioning uh, dealings at the, uh, you know, um, JIDA. People are questioning dealings at the Youth Employment Agency, that was that of SUBA. These were things that are happening. People were questioning the value for money and related it to corrupt practices. Precisely, and that's what I'm saying. That mm -hmm. that message was very powerful. Mm -hmm. There was no doubt about it. And these but I believe they couldn't meet all truths. You see, the bus brand. When you true. use yes, when you use the word corruption, mm -hmm. it has a meaning. You must not just say a bus has been branded. We think we have not had value for money for it, and automatically, it's a corruptible activity. That is one side of the equation. You need to show that perhaps it was marked up in such a way that somebody will take something out of it so you the inference must be lo must not be necessarily logical Is that, that once case? you have branded a bus and you say in the open market you can brand this bus at less the price it automatically means that somebody benefited privately privately from the uh, branding of that but of course the bus branding was given to somebody who's known I mean, who's known to be linked to the NDC. Yeah. And so she does and, and that top is, brass of the NDC. That is what worries me. Does that, Even yes. at that particular time, mm -hmm. I have tried to find out from my own sources what is exactly the linkage of this person to NDC. I've all enough in NDC, at least to know all people who have anchored their support with NDC. And I found it very difficult. Even people who knew who the actors were. You ask them about whether there was any political affiliation in which there were some benefits that came to NDC or to individual NDC. They couldn't tell you. So the connection Are you was suggesting not established. You, you don't know Selassie Ibrahim has been linked to the NDC? She was an agent that worked out this arrangement. Yes. The problem seems to come from the recipient. The one who did the actual fiscal branding. Because when you are talking about but corruption... Her company wait, I'm coming. When you are talking about corruption, she hasn't got a factory where she brands it. Mm -hmm. She definitely would facilitate it with the person who is the technical man and has that capacity. And so when you want to isolate one in this chain... But she sourced for the contract. Yes, but what I'm saying that... Yeah, so she paid that person. She certainly and, would. And, and, she and, wouldn't and, have just sat down mm -hmm. and written a figure and sent it and was given the money. She could have. She definitely would have gone to those who are going to provide the actual services to get the figures. Exactly. And let me tell you, you see, I'm saying and, that... And she, and she put her overheads yes, on it. Yes, we, but we don't necessarily mm. have to always look at human inadequacies in terms of wrong judgment at a particular time as corruptible as human beings we are all fallible there are some things you have done some years ago and today if you were asked to do the same thing because you've had some experience you wouldn't do it the same way that you did it the last time so let's not behave as if we are angels living now we are still human very much human with all our weaknesses including poor judgment mm. in relation to some of these matters. So before you tack the legal category of corrupt practices, I want to see the evidence. Mm. But Dr. Kubo, I mean, 
if you find yourself in a situation where a group, for instance, a group, a conglomerate, yeah. has been, you have groups, you have, you have other companies involved in deals that have been termed as not good, and that conglomerate keeps receiving deals from government, that would definitely raise eyebrows and people would comment about it. Yeah, but that's why I keep saying, if you look at the public, if I make it a vocation or an enterprise to go out there and expose governmental corruption, I will deal with it differently. I will make sure that the existing institutions that are supposed to address these issues are invoked. Mm. But why that is not done is because the people sometimes don't believe they themselves are firm on the ground in terms of the accusation. Mm. And so that is part of it. And that if you are not careful, a number of innocent people can get their reputation also destroyed just because there was a misjudgment at some point which necessarily didn't have any criminal intent to benefit from that financial. I'm not saying that is always the case in all these. Good. But I'm saying it is a possibility. So I don't want you to have to paint it in black and white as reality. Because in every black, there are packets of white. Mm -hmm. And in every white, there are black spots. That is social reality. You never have absolute black and absolute right when you are dealing with this situation. And that's why I think that sometimes we need to... I have heard people mm -hmm. who were accused when they were in government as very, very corrupt. When those people left government, they accused ministers who came as very, very corrupt. Now you want us to believe your present accusation of corruption and forget about yesterday when you were the victim of that accusation. So I'm saying that if we want to really go on a crusade, an anti-corruption crusade, we have to divorce it from fair weather situations. That when the wind blows favorably towards you, or when you point corruption towards you, it's destructive. But when you are pointing it against somebody, it is constructive. But you agree that perception of corruption affected your yes, electoral fortunes? Yes, the perception of it did. That is a fact that we can't run away with. And to be honest with you, it got to a point that people have equated the uh, perception as reality. And a number of media people have talked to me. They said, look, this statement that was issued that you are supporting, you have admitted that there was corruption. And I said, have you read the statement? Said that the perception of corruption, not corruption, was one that was successfully hanged on. Her. They look back at their script and say, okay, perception. So you see how the word perception and uh, uh, corruption by itself. Except that your founder Amazed. doesn't use perception. He talks of corruption. Well, that is the founder. Yes. And that is his view on these matters. Did it affect you? It got to a point the end people ran a commercial and used the founder talking about the government being corrupt. Yes. There are different styles of communicating, as you say. For me, as a professionally trained lawyer, I will be a bit circumspect when I'm using legal terms that have penal consequences i would have a way of dealing with it and if you've watched me i don't make absolute statements because there is no absolute truth mm, there's no absolute truth there's no absolute truth truths are relative and they're highly subjective don't listen to people who tell you that there is some objective truth out there that truth is always mediated by a number of facts mm, such so as what will be true for you now Depends on the number of ladders you are prepared to climb to see whether you can see what you are looking at as the real time. If people are comfortable with taking three steps on a ladder and they think they are clear. And for people, they don't like to use the word per perception because sometimes they don't really understand what that means for the simple reason that why is it that this thing is so widespread? It's being said everywhere. Mm. Then we begin to see some semblance of reality like the branding of the buses that you have mentioned so people will look at it that way but they are not bound by the ethical professional rules that hold me in check mm. so what you can get away with a professional lawyer cannot get away with it mm. it all counts in your ethics okay we definitely would come back and uh, you know look at the way forward now that we've been able to establish some way somehow uh, you know what might have caused the ndc's defeat when we return after this break We'll find out the way forward for the NDC. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break.
Right, so welcome back from our final break and thanks for staying with us. I still have uh, Dr. Benjamin Kumbo here with me. So, Dr. Kumbo, what's the way forward for the NDC? Yeah, the way forward has been started with the committee mm. and one is not expecting the report of the committee to be rocket science, mm. but it is going to be one that would distill and confront the reality outside the major cities in Accra in terms of how the rank and file of the party is taking defeat. Once you have had that type of data put together, it can even be unpleasant, unple but it begins to give you pointers. And from there, you move. And I think the second one would be reconciliation. Mm. You have seen the acrimony, internal acrimony, since we lost the elections. We should not pretend that people are not hurt, either in the processes to the elections or the defeat itself and its aftermath. There are many people that are very hurt. And you must find mm -hmm. out what has hurt them. And if you listen to the complaints and agitation, you get to know. The next step is that to identify these concerns. Is it governmental challenges? Is it party inefficiency? Is it the caliber of people that you can easily throw mad of corruption on? Is it you can take all those scenarios. Those that require reconciliation, you do it. Because I can assure you that in some constituencies, Members of the executive cannot sit together without exchanging blows. Mm. Executive in DCE will never meet. Minister and this person will never meet. Everybody has a story. Mm. Everybody is riding on high horses and nobody can bring them down. Fortunately, we met a low branch in the elections and we all came down. As we are there now, let's look at each other eye for eye and say, this is my problem and this is what I've done. If you don't go to that. Secondly, Make sure Bernard Shaw says that even the indolent has his wisdom. And you must listen to it. If you do not listen to somebody's stupidity, mm. and you believe that you have wisdom, there are people who are prepared to die in their stupidity than to live under another person's wisdom. And that is why you don't take people for granted. And the anomic expressions that you see and anger and so-called politically incorrect ways that people are using and people say they cannot use them. You are again escaping and running okay. away from the problem. So what are you calling for? The thirdly yeah, okay, is a physical one. Mm -hmm. The electoral rule, how it came into being. Big technology, and everybody knows that when you are introducing a technology, you pilot it first. The piloting will tell you some of the shortcomings. Unfortunately, we did not do that. And the shortcomings have been translated to us now in a massive electoral defeat which means the integrity of our register is questionable hmm. just watch the statistics of the winning the margins you're of talking the about winning. the registers in the ndc's internal the, register. Yes, internal register sure. look at and the figure that was given as the total registered voters in the ndc it tells you a story, what story because i don't think you? radically registered loyal party members could just within a time frame of one year, three months, when the register was prepared, just say that I'm not going to vote for this party. It is too abrupt. And that is not how the human mind works. Mm. It meant that you had in that register people who were never committed to the NDC in the first place. Either as floating voters or people from other political parties who believe that there are some crumbs to be picked from an incumbent government party. Were they? Well, I hear the media talking about it. That let's hold a debate on winner take all. And you see, again, you've jumped to a higher step. Going to run for political office is for service. Mm -hmm. There is nothing there for anybody to take. So we should not even be complaining. That is the ideal situation, isn't it? Dr. Yes, Kumbo? but I'm telling you. So we That's should the ideal situation. The reality is that there's something that people to take. We have to approximate mm -hmm. idealism. Mm -hmm. You see, when you set up a very low high jump bar for yourself and you mm. always jump across it you think you are doing well raise the bar and go across it okay and you see how so let's raise it. the bar let's raise the bar in relation to these issues these that issues. we are dealing with should yeah. president mahama be returned as flag bearer of the ndc that's for mama and when he chooses says he wants to contest and goes to congress if you were to advise him. congress that's why i keep telling people you see advice is south is not imposed 
you can't get up and carry a basket of advice and be going around and say like uh, the one who sells coco drew and say look i have advice in this bag should i give it to you no somebody must come and ask that can you please give me your candid opinion on this matter then you are in a position but you don't go and say you you, you sit down here i have to advise you but those who are calling for him to come back as the flag bearer from where you sit i mean you're a leading member of the party yeah. do you think he should come back what i'm saying is that for people to speak for the former president when he has not publicly announced them as a spokesman and he is not dead he's not incapacitated it's a bit worrying but dr Kumbu, because he knows why mm -hmm. he will not come out now one way or the other why should i be the one to come out but dr kumbo you do know that in politics it's not always about you sometimes it gets to the point where people will impress upon you yes and that is the problem yes so in those so people situations are impressing upon let me tell you in those situations president. even not at the level of presidency mm. i will never ask somebody to be forced into leadership mm. i will never invite that type of situation because it is not in the heart and it looks too I mean simplistic what do you do is that let the person come and come and say look i want to offer myself again and if he comes and back, there are reasons if he comes back when he stand a chance do you think he stands a when chance? he comes you go to a congress mm. yes you can't preempt there are a lot of dynamics between now and that time mm. and i've been saying that in a very fluid political situation it's a bit difficult to stick out your neck now and say that if you were to come out and say he'll stand again automatically it triggers off a number of things but when he comes out to say that he's going to contest then we have moved to another threshold okay. and the rules of engagement become become different mm. then he can move to another threshold. would you support him what i'm saying is that you can support what doesn't exist no, if if wait i don't answer if questions <laughs> you see i'm a very practical I, man i, I get you i get you on yes, that score, but yes. why do you say you you need to go for an early congress for instance, just look at the number of congresses that we hold. The constitution says every four years. Mm -hmm. So the current certain officers from the branch level to the national level would only be leaving office or retaining their positions in 2018. How will you be able to conduct from branch to constituency, to regional, to national, and possibly eventually your flag bearer? You are talking about mid-2019. Mm. With this defeat margin that we have we cannot afford to gamble that way because you should always leave a gap in between replacing your officers and legal challenges that could take place in which injunctions could be placed on the processes and NDC has a lot of evidence of that so you must start early so that you are battle ready early and then you hit the ground but if anybody is talking a constitution is supposed to serve the fortunes of a party mm. and so that's why you have residual powers reserved for fact and neck in the constitution so should you run into a political open movement like we have now and you just find that you just cannot follow the constitutional timetable you invoke those residual powers like we've done before mm. and abridge the time and go for early congress would you want to run for any of the positions well that is why i want to have my discussions where you know what my supervisor used to tell me when tell i wrote chapters of my thesis the first one i thought i had written the best thing because when i took it i didn't see any red ink at the back i only saw a comment he says ben eventually you have to move or walk on two feet but before that you have to take a confident first step let's take these issues as and when they come there is nobody today that has declared that there's any vacancy available in the ndc for anybody to run for so I cannot be announcing whether I'll be running for what doesn't exist. Mm. Well, some will say when a politician says, let's wait and see, is more like a politician saying, well, yes, I would give but it a But you know, try. I'm particularly not a typical politician. I'm not a good politician. I do agree really? that, yes, I'm not. You're not? The African politician, no. <laughs> Finally, before we go, <laughs> Dr. Kumbwa, <laughs> let me just run by you some names that have also been springing up there, uh, the likes of uh, Akospi Ogabra, uh, Joshua Labi for flag brushup of the NDC. What do you make of these names? Sylvester Mensa? Well, some of them, I'm hearing them for the first time. Mm. But I guess that they are available. They can speak for themselves. When they do offer themselves and go and pick nomination forms and come to tell me that I'm also going to contest, 
I will now have the opportunity of looking at all of them and deciding where my vote should go to. Remember, my vote is not one of the simple votes. It's a very informed and mature vote. Mm. I don't follow the wind and I don't follow the crowd. Let's get to that bridge and we'll cross it. But these are people you believe can lead to the NDC? In fact, I have told a sister TV station that both NPP and NDC, you should be able to ask for 50 presidential candidates and within a one hour they should produce them. Otherwise, you are not a formidable political party. So let's not make it look like we are really lacking for presidential candidates. They are there. So when I hear about 3, 4 or 15, that doesn't really tickle me. Because I believe major political parties should be able to spin up 50 presidential candidates within two hours if they were asked to produce them. Do you believe the NDC would, win, would come back uh, in the next election, 2020? It depends on what we do and if we want to win. And if you want to win? Yes. Don't you want to win? Well, you have a challenge. When you talk about winning, it also means others will lose. And when you talk about losing, it means others will win. That is a summary of where NDC stands now. I have talked to a number of people who are die-hard NDC. And they have always asked me a question like you saw in the statement. That victory for who? They believe that the past victory, they were never part of it. Mm. And perhaps their circumstances were worse off because they would have defied some patrons to follow the NDC. And those patrons used to give them a bit of bread and butter. So, so let's clear the mm -hmm. ground very well and then we see whether we should be very, very optimistic Finally, of victory. When yeah. you say they, they feel they were not part of the victory, that of Mills or that of Mahama? In fact, in every government, but it depends on how you handle yes, it. Yes, but these people who are complaining. Heard, I have heard mm -hmm. even under the NPP, in which people complain. Yes, but coming to then the NDC, under Mills and or Mahama. And when you come to the NDC, at every point, there are always people who Including that of Mills and Mahama. Yes, both. I have heard somebody who, and it was a joke we were cracking, who came and says, since the party won, he has not had anything. That was under Professor Mills. Mm. He only had four contracts. <laughs> so you see, the not having anything mm. is very subjective. Okay. For some, it is zero. For others, they have 10, but they wish they had 50. So when you get to this type of, you need to assess the individual situation. Dr. Kumbo. Thank you very You're much welcome. for joining us. Yeah. We're very grateful. So, folks, that's all from us uh, this afternoon right here on Hot Issues on TV3. On behalf of the team, thank you so much for joining us. Well, uh, make sure you make a date with us. Same time next week. And, of course, you can catch me on Monday on Sunrise on 3FM 92.7 from 5.55 to 10 a.m. Have a lovely weekend. My name is Winston Amon.